Chapter 37 of The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 37. Dr. Juno Again in the Insane Asylum Inside of the Insane Asylum, blood was frequently shed by those who were made victims by the actions of the sectarian practices. When the physician-in-chief entered the cell of General Washington Armington, the general was talking to himself for several minutes before he took notice that the doctor was present. But the moment the crazy man saw his keeper, or doctor, he sprang upon him like an infuriated fiend, and cried aloud, "'You are one of them!' which fairly unhinged the brave physician's nerves, and caused him to lose his presence of mind. When the general tore the flesh from his face, and caused the blood to fly in streams, the physician-in-chief screamed terribly, but in insane asylums there was so much noise made by the inmates that no one who was close at hand took any notice of it, until the unlucky doctor cried in a very boisterous voice, "'George, come here, quick! I am being murdered by General Armington!' George was a keeper of the ward, and he was only a short distance from the general's cell, therefore heard and knew the doctor's voice, which caused him to make for the place." And when he reached the cell door, behold, the physician-in-chief had bolted the same, and let the key remain in the inside, which prevented George from unlocking or opening the only passage of access to the place where the crazy general was sitting astride the physician-in-chief. And with one hand and his weighty body the general held the hands of the doctor, and with the other hand he was pounding the bleeding physician in the face with fiendish fury whilst the general continually cried out, "'Give me my daughter! Give me my daughter, you fiend! You fiend!' What to do George did not know for an instant, but he quickly ran toward the office and screamed, "'Bring help! Bring hammers and cold chisels! For my master is being murdered by General Armington!' Instantly dozens of the help, and besides innocent lunatics, rushed to the spot of danger, and in thirty minutes they succeeded in forcing the stronghold open. All this time the crazy man continued pounding the doctor, who was nearly exhausted from the loss of blood and the terrible bruises which he received. They grasped the general and ironed him, and carried the almost murdered doctor to his office. Medical attendance was bestowed upon him, but all hope of restoration was well nigh abandoned. He sank into an unconscious state, and remained so for three days, when he seemed to improve very rapidly, and in several weeks he was able to be about his business. But he always gave the crazy general a wide berth, and was very cautious to keep him securely locked up. Dr. Juno learned that General Washington Armington was confined in this model asylum, and he was very anxious to visit him but every attempt that Dr. Juno made to get access to the asylum was thwarted, until, finally, he got acquainted with some influential public men, and through their instrumentality he was granted permission to visit the general. The moment the latter saw Dr. Juno, he began to weep and moan in the most heart-rending manner, and mumbled, "'Oh, my dear son, where, where, where is my daughter?' Dr. Juno said, Noble father, I have done my utmost to find her. Still I have failed to learn even the least traces of her. But I have some suspicion that she is not very far from here. To this reply the general made no answer, but repeated the above sentence without cessation. Dr. Juno saw that the man was really insane, therefore he got ready to leave the asylum, but as he moved toward the door of exit, suddenly he was seized, blindfolded, and gagged. End of chapter 37
Recording by Meg Turasek. Chapter 38 of the Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 38. Deacon Stew Frantic with Delirium. The riot amongst the bloody conspirators in Tabernacle Hall lasted for nearly one hour before anything like order was established. The principal party that was being assaulted was Deacon Rob Stew and Reverend Joe Peer, because the majority were overawed time and again by these two great leaders, and Deacon Stew had just a moment previous summarily chastised a brother for uttering similar but less offensive language. The deacon even threatened that brother, and all the saints, without compassion, with the penalty of the solemn oath and fate of Harry Gossamer, the apostate, and then spoke himself in the most reckless, silly, and apostatic manner, when the Reverend Joe Peer confirmed the same by permitting the deacon to go on, until Dr. Tory Pansy asked him a question, which so opened the deacon's eyes as to almost cause them to start from their sockets. Deacon Rob Stew evidently had forgotten himself at the time he uttered those words, proving the course and teachings of Dr. Juno, which so enraged the balance of the brothers, who were always snubbed and chastised by his deaconship if they made the least slip of the tongue, that they almost killed both the saintly deacon and cowardly reverend President Joe Peer. Had it not been for the wise and dignified Nancy Clover, these two tyrants would have surely had their beating hearts torn out by their roots. But Sister Nancy Clover evidently considered it wisdom to permit the snubbed saints to thoroughly beat these domineering twain, who became rather too overbearing. And when she thought they had enough, she mounted the president's rostrum and, springing into the chair, cried with a loud but dignified voice, "'Hold, fellow saints!' You have done enough of this for the present. I wish you all to comprehend that neither of us can be benefited by fighting, for assuredly a house divided against itself must fall, and great will be our fall. You are all sure of that. Then, why beat and abuse these zealous, hard-working brethren, who have devoted more time, money, and mind to this holy work of sustaining the cause of the elect than this whole community combined? I say justly, therefore, that they have a perfect right to express themselves more freely in this conclave than the rest of you. Although I think myself that Brother Rob Stew made some foolish remarks, but I want you, and him also, to understand that I do not say this because he is almost dead by the thrashing which you gave him and Reverend Brother Joe Peer, for I am not afraid to speak my sentiments on any occasion." as brothers Stew and Peer will not be able to transact any more business for a short season, I propose to take the floor, if Dr. Tory Pansy will take the chair. After the six brethren are removed to the antechamber, their wounds dressed by the doctor and each made comfortable. They were at once carefully carried into the handsomely furnished antechamber and placed on separate lounges. Deacon Stew was beaten so badly about the head that his mind wandered and his face and head swelled awfully. Reverend Joe Peer was not so much hurt on the head, but he complained greatly of his side and lamented as follows, lest he should die. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, save my miserable life only this time, and I will be a better man in the future. Indeed, indeed I will. Therefore save, O oh save my life." Sister Nancy Clover made a slight examination of the sufferers after the doctor had dressed their wounds, and when Reverend Joe Peer bide his beloved sister Nancy, he said, O oh, holy sister, pray for me, and dear, dear sweet sister, tell me, B O B O O, do you think I will die from this bruise? God save me. No, Brother Peer, you won't die. "'Be more manly, and you will soon be well again,' responded Nancy Clover. Ten thousand thanks, angel sister. 
your charming voice and enchanting words always thrill my heart with joy and cause my whole physical nature to warm and strengthen i am much better already by your ethereal power do stay by my side won't you angel of my soul sadly said the awfully pious rev joe peer no sir i cannot remain with you for i must go to pacify the saints or they may get to quarrelling again and in the heat of passion come in here and beat you worse than before exclaimed nancy clover oh lord help me go quick and prevent them from assaulting me again said he i will do so after i ask the deacon how he is brother stew how do you feel are you conscious of what is going on asked nancy clover but the deacon made no answer when the queenly saint passed into the hall and after dr torpancy was seated in the chair she spoke as follows beloved saints whilst i regret very much that this war amongst god's elect has taken place i nevertheless do not doubt but what he so willed it for everything is preordained and the elect may anger and sin not this has been the case with some of us this evening and as our worthy president and more worthy deacon are lying probably on their deathbeds we should pour out our hearts to god in humble supplication to strengthen us in love and charity for the saints and now as i feel and see that you are all grieved at heart at what has occurred i am free to say that we can confide in one another and go on as if nothing had happened it will take several weeks careful nursing to restore our brethren and in the meantime i propose that we unanimously arouse the wordlings by telling them of the great danger that hangs now over them on account of dr juno preaching and spreading forth energetically his vulgar natural doctrines we all know that by nature we are defiled and abased therefore to me his teaching of natural things is repugnant to my maiden feelings and inherent saintly modesty at this moment deacon rob stew staggered into the hall in a demoniacal manner and proclaimed damnation to apostates and usurpers which caused a furious rush toward him End chapter thirty eight recording by meg Turasek. chapter thirty nine of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by meg Turasek. the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter thirty nine nancy clover makes a master speech to the conspirators had it not happened that sister nancy clover had been lecturing the belligerent saints the deacon undoubtedly would have been killed then and there but the royal sister was still on the floor when the delirious deacon came into the hall and she simply waved them back with her hand and ordered the sentinel to remove him to his lounge which was more however than one man could do because delirious people are always stronger when in this state than when calm it took six men to carry him back to his chamber dr pansy was compelled to leave the chair and attend to the deacon nancy clover therefore asked a meek brother to act as president for the balance of the evening when she continued i reiterate that it is vulgar in fact bordering on the worst form of obscenity for a man to be continually preaching lecturing and writing on natural religion natural laws natural improvement of the race the only way in which the race can be improved is by conversion by faith in the atoning blood and by the grace of god the elect saints receive all the grace that god designed for his chosen people and as we are so blessed as we are the elect who cannot sin therefore in our hands all things are purified we have a right from on high through the grace of christ to use everything that we see 
and use it as we please. But what right have the non-elect to the kingdom of God, and to the rights and privileges that are only vouchsafed unto us? We, as the chosen people of the Lord, have a perfect right to use these people to our liking. Hence, I say, why not conspire with, or solicit our enemies, or slaves? I mean the giddy worldlings, such as tipplers, rogues, politicians, or whoever or whatever they are, to join us, because they were born for our use. They and their everything belong to us. Then, what scruples can we have to get them to fight as our allies, to subdue and annihilate all innovators? And this, Dr. Juno, is the only dangerous man that lives because he endeavors to give a new and scientific explanation of the Holy Bible, and by that new interpretation he proves to his hearers and readers that the Bible and science agree, a thing that cannot be, or, if such would be the case, then our holy religion surely could not be sound. We need not dread any innovators who denounce the Holy Bible as being a fallible work, because they can easily be cried down by us. But this audacious Juno takes our own instrument of salvation, and endeavors to explain every portion of it upon fixed natural principles, upon principles that the natural man and carnal mind can understand, as people comprehend the multiplication table. Now, brethren and sisters, I want your vote upon this question. Do you not think that, if Dr. Juno can make the natural man understand that the teachings of the Divine Master are only the teachings of nature, or the teachings of a natural law, that our holy cause will be esteemed as a bogus one? All those who believe in the affirmative please rise to their feet and say, I. The entire sainthood unanimously agree with me. Then, again, does not our sainthood suffer from such a man as Dr. Juno than from all the balance of infidels, atheists, heretics, worldlings, and agitators of isms and schisms combined? Those who think so, please rise and say I, as before. Again, unanimous, continued she, and as such we shall set ourselves individually and collectively to work to-morrow to urge all classes to aid us in subduing Dr. Juno. Voices rang out vociferously from all parts of the hall. Hear, hear! The physician-in-chief of the insane asylum rose and said, I did not expect to make any remarks this evening. But things have taken such a peculiar turn that I wish to express my views on the appropriate remarks of our excellent sister Nancy Clover. Should her counsel be rigidly heeded by every individual of this brotherhood, I am sure victory would crown our efforts. I see a great deal of danger breeding, and although those who are now in high offices as well as the evangelical ministers and standard medical doctors, are our friends. But these are nothing compared with the masses of the people. And once let a furor be made in favor of Dr. Juno, and you will see what one man can do, who is bad, bold, and indomitable like he. It has always been one mind that moved the masses. Look at Napoleon I and from time immemorial the fearless agitator of reform or deform by perseverance gained his end because a lie often repeated becomes a truth in the estimation of the masses of the people and we certainly should not be blind to the fact that it was a bad move to have given dr juno an open trial in the court of sessions and permit his friends to publish the same in pamphlet form to the world. Because the people are always crazy to read sensational matters. Therefore, the sale of his book on The Physiology of Marriage has been greatly increased, and the masses of the people 
say it is just the book they need and want to enlighten them how to prevent the various domestic ailments which injures both the business of our medical profession and that of the ministers because he reasons in that book that man must and can become his own saviour by learning and returning to the laws of nature a thing that is very absurd but nevertheless such heresy suits the non-elect who are very greatly in the majority and whose attention has been riveted to the name of dr juno through that open trial conviction and imprisonment of the innovator our people have made a martyr of him is the cry everywhere except among the elect and a few others now i have closely watched all the plans that have been laid and discussed to disgrace ruin and kill him but there is one excellent method of branding him as an abortionist and no one has thought of and it must be known that even the masses of the non-elect despise and detest abortionists in sooth they are murderers here is my plan the druggist who can be trusted will manufacture specific pills for producing abortion and label them dr juno's female regulating pills and if these druggists do not desire to sell them to the people themselves they can introduce them to the patient medicine trade and then get up a talk that dr juno is manufacturing and selling specific abortion pills which are sold publicly by that class of druggists who deal in patent medicines three birds will be killed with one stone in so doing first the manufacturers will make a great deal of money on these pills at dr juno's expense and through his notoriety secondly the patent medicine dealers who are none of the standard bearers will be despised and disreputably touched up and thirdly the celebrated dr juno will get a fame as the great abortionist which will be as good as stabbing him to the heart in the estimation of the million who he might chain and charm without this stigma noble thoughts brother worthy the esteem of the whole sainthood and i hope that several of our faithful druggists will be selected instantly who are here present as a committee of operation because the plan is excellent and if brothers stew and peer were well enough to comprehend it they would cheerfully cry yea and amen to this most cunning little game brother you have my heartfelt thanks for these holy thoughts i move that the president pro tem will appoint the three brother druggists whom i see in the hall as a committee to manufacture and motion these pills into circulation said sister nancy clover i second that motion responded a brother all right exclaimed several voices and just as the president pro tem had announced the names of the committee dr toy pansy entered the hall with a downcast expression and said solemnly i fear deacon stew the beloved is expiring end of chapter thirty nine recording by mag Turasek. Chapter 40 of The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 40 Dr. Juno, Pat O'Connor, and Judy McCrae in Private Council. In the insane asylum, after Dr. Juno was seized and gagged, a consultation of the managers was held to devise plans what to do with him. Some wanted him confined again in his old dungeon, but the physician in chief said, since deacon rob stew and reverend joe peer are lying at the point of death 
and from the fact that an influential person caused Juno's permission to visit General Armington, I esteem it highly imprudent to retain him, or even harm him in any manner. But what can we do with him, now that we have had him thus summarily seized and gagged? said another. That may be bad for us, because he may go out and expose us, responded a third party. Yes, and I heard him say to General Armington that he suspicioned that Miss Armington was confined not far from the general's cell, said another. I wonder if he really believes her to be in our possession. If he does, I dread the consequences, should we let him off now. Anyway, we dare not retain him in custody. But, I have it, some of the keepers can free Dr. Juno from his present shackles, and feign great anger and surprise at discovering this assault on him, stating that it was the innocent lunatics who did it, that are permitted to run loose in that ward, and who were grievously annoyed when, a short time since, General Armington assaulted and almost killed the physician-in-chief. They evidently concluded that Dr. Juno was a friend to the general, and therefore took it into their heads to grab him. This will explain the matter satisfactory to Dr. Juno, especially if caution is exercised and great innocence assumed. Go then and do this instantly, for every moment will aggravate the matter. And should he say, why did the officers not then and there stop them from this outrage? Say that the latter were afraid to do so without assistance, which they now come to offer, said the physician-in-chief. Dr. Juno was once relieved, and the foregoing explanation was made, but he said, This is curious, and looked as if he had great doubts about the matter. He did not say anything more, but he thought, How is this? I cannot understand exactly why they should seize and gag me one moment and free me the next. That apology about the innocent lunatics was a lame one, which will not go down with me. I think they had fully intended to again cast me into that cell, or probably murder me, but they are commencing to fear my influence. Wait, boys, a little longer, and provided I live, if I do not bring your shanty down, I am a fool, and thereby free my darling Lucinda, who, I am now, more than ever convinced, is incarcerated in some secret cell in this hell-hole. If I only knew someone that was acquainted with this place, or who knows any of the servants in this asylum— the Armingtons are all in this place. But there is Pat O'Connor and Judy McCrae, who may know what I want to know. I will instantly go to Pat O'Connor and question him. However, he seemed to shun me on previous occasions. But that evidently was through fear of the bloody conspirators. However, I can try him. I will see him privately, and... If he only fears exposure, and has no other feelings against me, he will aid and enlighten me all he can. He went in disguise that very night, about ten o'clock, to Pat O'Connor's residence, and asked to see him. Judy came to the door, and said that Pat would be in in a few minutes. Would he take a sate and wait? Yes, ma'am, said the doctor, and asked, Are you Judy McCrae? I beast that lady, she replied. Do you and Pat O'Connor live alone in this large house, since the general is in the insane asylum? asked the doctor. Yes, sir, we do. And is there anything more that ye ilk to know? interposed Judy rather angrily. There is something more, Judy. I love your lost mistress, Lucinda, and I have news for you and I came here to ask you and Pat to assist me, if you can, to relieve her from her cruel imprisonment. Ach, holy Moses! And who be ye? 
for what i knows you may be a tryin to get meself and pat darlin into trouble interrupted judy i'm dr juno your friend in disguise said he and removing his disguise proved to judy the truth of his assertion thanks to the lord for a comin to see us for pat wanted to see ye badly but he was afeard to go where ye was for he was a dreadin them bloody devils responded judy overcome with such vehement joy that she laughed and cried at once at this moment pat o'connor entered the house when judy called to him pat darlin air ye be yourself alone yes judy me darlin said pat then come in some one you know bees here she ejaculated god bless ye good dr juno but i's glad to see ye and do you know anything of our mistress and master choking with delight said pat yes sir faithful pat i have been to see the general in the insane asylum and found him really insane but i could not learn anything of miss lucinda armington however i sincerely believe that she also is imprisoned in that place not for insanity but for having been my friend i came to see you particularly to inquire if you can give me any information in any way of the dark deeds of these bloody people exclaimed dr juno and sure ye noble sir i can give you such information if ye can manage not to tell on me said pat certainly good pat i would not expose you said he because that would ruin everything we must work in secret as well as they or we cannot save our dear friends and benefactors i mean miss lucinda and her father and sure ye air right interrupted pat and i will tell ye that i knows this many a day that ye were confined in that divil of a dungeon and that our mistress be caged in one of them third-story cells of that place pat you say you know it but can you inform me how you know this asked he yes sir i'll tell you how i knows it jemmy me friend what is now in the penitentiary was an overseer within that asylum and judy and meself told jemmy to hunt for ye and our mistress and he did so and found ye both and he told me that he would let ye both out if he could and i think he was caught a doin they work and that is why these divils put him into the prison said pat very much distressed oh lord oh lord pat i have it all now in my mind jemmy opened my cell and was the sole cause of my escape from that hell-hole was he bedad i told judy i believed he had to do with your escape said pat half crazy with joy but will ye not do something quickerer than lightnin to get my sweet mistress out or of that divil of a place yes sir i will do that just as soon as i can gather sufficient people and influence around me to do it successfully but it would be foolish to try sooner and fail much better keep everything quiet until i am strong enough to strike a fatal blow i will get a permit from the governor of the commonwealth to visit jemmy in the penitentiary and will learn particulars said dr juno ach murder and ye knows how to work them curmudgeon and i have more to tell ye of things i knows responded pat well sir now is your time to speak and it is very necessary for me to get all the information instantly that it is possible for me to receive said he i'll tell ye i saved a man's life what was 
a goin to be drowned in the deep sea by these bloody devils and just as we mr harry gossamer and myself reached that wharf becora we were both arrested judy darlin i hears a knock on the door doctor please get in this closet ejaculated pat End of chapter 40 Recording by Mag Turasek Chapter 41 of The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mag Turasek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 41. Dr. Juno's Stunning Sermon on the Improvement of Church and State. Beloved friends, until church and state, in my sense of what the church is, become one, and an indivisible institution, there can be no perpetual natural or christian government established where god's will will be done in earth as it is in heaven nor can peace and good will reign between the children of his footstool before being able to elucidate this subject scientifically it behooves me to show you that church and state simply aim at government the government of mankind but before mankind can be governed aright, each one must first learn to understand God's fixed law that was ordained for man's government, and he must then be able to govern himself, and that fixed law is his king, which he must obey, or suffer the penalties that are sure to follow all violations of the Creator's immutable injunctions. Now then, look at church and state, as they are conducted at this age whether in this or any other country and you will see that both are antichrist and anti-natural institutions they are like a perfect fruit tree that has been split in two and each half hacked to pieces by the woodman and whilst nothing but god's fixed law can sustain and again heal the tree it therefore behooves the governor of treehood to return to this unchangeable scientific law of the creator and thereby bring into existence a new stock stem blossom and fruit the latter of which will contain good seed which when planted in new earth produces a new heaven on terra firma when love to god and love to man would be the only statute that would be necessary for the government of all people and all nations and thus indeed the millennium would be established and stupid sects and wicked politician parties would be esteemed by the sons and daughters of earth as mean low and vulgar thus parliament congress and state legislatures would be useless institutions and the ruinous business of continually much and often voting by a people who know not a whit of the fixed law of a christ-like government would cease to exist whilst love to god and man should drive selfishness from the heart of mankind and the infallibility and beneficence of god would be recognized by every human mind and the following divine mandates would be heeded that he allows the sun to shine and the rain to fall upon all alike and that no one brings anything into the world nor takes anything out of it that is carnal on the contrary let me briefly picture to you the heathen barbarity that the people practice upon one another as church and state move now or have done since the fall of man or since money and voting have been the cardinal virtues of the government of this whole machine of human affairs 
the church as now conducted including all sects is an institution that throws all the responsibility of mismanaged government of body soul or spirit upon the blessed and immutable creator of all things an institution that recognizes no alterable science of life in its tenets an institution that in its short-sightedness has inscribed upon its banner believe and be saved whilst it overlooks the multitudinous injunctions of god nature and jesus christ that point with the finger of science to good works by which all are to let their light shine before men these good works consist in the government of thinking beings so that they understand appreciate and live the natural life that christ himself led showing that although one has no place where to lay his head still he would continue faithful to the end an institution that builds brick-and-mortar houses and dedicates or devotes them to god instead of its devotees devoting themselves body soul and spirit to god as jesus did and instead of establishing one universal catholic church which is composed of all the fixed laws and wonderful works of god it splits the church of christ into hundreds of contemptible ignorant bigoted narrow-minded sects whose dupes make excellent fodder for politicians legislators governors and petty office seekers who contrive to run the state or states to suit their opinions tastes and feelings an institution whose ministers or apostles sell out to the highest lucre bidders like all the voters in state hence love the uppermost seats as feasts and who do not despise to be called of men rabbi who do not first seek the kingdom of god in the fixed laws and wonderful works of god because their prayer hearing master is as changeable and fickle as their opinions and perverted propensities are variable thus there is no one king but each can be saved by believing and dictating to his sectarian money and voting god what he wants or needs in the shape of grace and the little trifles that each peculiar sect approves an institution that inculcates nothing whereby the blood and body of mankind would be improved in physiological quality thereby resembling the pure blood and body of jesus christ but their sectarian lucre and voting god rectifies all these little physical matters if faith and prayer are kept a-going an institution that spurns the fixed laws of generation and regeneration because these devotees love all sorts of good palatable things wherewith a little physical pleasure can be drawn out of these palaces of the believers and by blarneying their god a little he purifies the blood by washing it in the pool of faith prayer and voting an institution whose devotees need not make any change in their habits that pertain to physical perfection because faith prayer and voting changes the heart and purifies the soul even if the body is rotten an institution that spits god in the face mocks jesus christ defies natural fixed law and crucifies and martyrs the benefactors of the human race look at my persecutors the midnight cutthroats the bloody conspirators the companions of the right-hand imps of the devil these are parents of the sectarian church an institution whose cunning leaders laugh into their sleeves when they can dupe and mislead millions of sincere people who 
if they had an opportunity to learn the laws that govern god's kingdom in heaven and earth would freely embrace the hallowed immutable and beneficent gifts of the creator and become the followers of jesus christ in word and in deed an institution whose members and hangers-on are moved by some kind of gain yes gain that has no significance to the attainment of heavenly glory but gain in wealth influence sensuality fashion folly domineering and the dainty deviltries that are pleasingly hid under a sanctimonious and hypocritical exterior and which so adorn the elect for the more effectual dispensation of nonsense to their galled hearers from all such pharisaical and antichrist acts good lord deliver us end of chapter forty one recording by meg Turasek. chapter forty two of the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by meg Turasek. the social war of nineteen hundred or the conspirators and lovers by simon landis chapter forty two dr juno's scathing sermon continued the state as now conducted is an institution where cunning men mislead and make drunk with rum and flowery meaningless logic the masses of the voters who are esteemed by the wily scoundrels good fellows when voting is to be done to elevate them to positions which they yearn to usurp that they may rob the children of earth of lucre and of their inalienable religious or natural liberties an institution that places haughty cutthroats and wholesale thieves into the offices of trust of the government who love filthy lucre moses seat the uppermost seats at feasts and prejudice more than god nature man or jesus christ an institution that can place a judge sanctiblower on the judicial bench whose prejudice and malice far excel his virtue and wisdom and who can be pompous and elated over those who honestly and by hard labor earn the money which he steals unmeritoriously from the coffers of the state treasury an institution that bribes its legislators to enact laws to suit the pharisees and wholesale thieves that they may continue to control the filthy lucre and domineer and enslave the innocent poor and confiding an institution that drives thousands into the broad road that leads to hell impoverishes the millions at the glory of the few drives many thereby to commit crime who are compelled to steal or starve and builds prisons penitentiaries insane asylums and poorhouses for which the poor are taxed to pay for the erection and sustenance of these hellholes into which they are cast for acts and conditions over which they had no control and there to ache out a more miserable existence whilst the popular cutthroats and wholesale thieves revel in wealth and power an institution that spurns those whom the beloved jesus came to heal and save and in the government of which institution christ himself should he return to earth could not get a voice or position unless he would denounce all his former teachings and turn scribe pharisee hypocrite and robber of men's rights to live breathe feel think and act as nature and nature's god demand an institution that is founded upon error and improved by the votes of the drunken rabble 
who will sell their birthright for a mess of pottage or a drink of rum. An institution that sustains its paramour, the sectarian church, as long as the latter plays into the former's coffers, and breeds enough dupes to fill the field of state with deteriorated voters, that the majority may rule, although Christ says, Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it, whilst wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be who go in thereat. Therefore, gainsay my doctrines, if you dare, by scanning the subject from any standpoint. Again, I assert, and defy contradiction, by theory or practice, that a republican government that divides church and state, and permits the Pharisees, willful and ignorant sinners, to rule it, is a perfect failure. As an example, look at our own American Republic. Is it not the meanest monarchy, filthy lucre monarchy, and most thieving and profligate tyranny on the globe? Certainly, it is not a government of an Eden nor paradise, where clear-headed, clean-blooded, and graceful people govern themselves and one another according to the injunctions of Christ, God, or nature. However, I cannot ask the sectarian and political people to jump from their antichrist, antinatural, drunken, money-grabbing, and hoarding condition into a state of Eden gladness, because to ask this would be throwing pearls before swine, and they would trample them under foot, and turn around and rend me, as the bloody conspirators have already tried their best to do. But I shall propose, as the first and foremost thing to be done to bring about the day of the millennium, is to so change the constitution of our government as to make it a crime for any person to own more than ten thousand dollars, that the nation shall have a treasury, into which all monies over and above ten thousand dollars of each owner shall be placed, without interest, but that for all sums of lucre that any person shall put into the treasury, he or she shall receive a deed for such amount or amounts and, if he or she should at any time have an increase of family, or be unfortunate in life, he or she, or his or her heirs, may draw out again the principle of all that he or she has placed into the treasury. The treasury shall provide necessary labor for each man and woman who is not able to take care of himself or herself that no one shall fail to do his or her share of work who is not independent. And idling and vagrancy shall be punished by incarceration in the physiological institution, where farming and all the necessary trades shall be carried on on healthful principles. After the machine of a Christ-like government will be carried on in this way for one or two centuries, the Holy Ghost will find such an abundant room in the temples of God that filthy lucre and an artificial or political constitution will be considered entirely obsolete, and the millennium will be established, when love to God and man will constitute the only constitution which each person will carry within this palace of the soul. Thus, diseases, crime, avarice, penury, and all the multitudinous ills and vices of human nature would vanish. When pedophagers, quacks, in their healing art, lawmakers, judges, hireling ministers, misers, wholesale thieves, tyrants, blind leaders of the blind, and bloody conspirators would be the very ones who should fill the cells of the prisons, houses of correction, etc., 
which they now erect and fill with those whom they manufacture by their pharisaical charlatanism. These governors of church and state make men traps, and then generate victims to fill them. Therefore, they do nothing to prevent disease and crime, but they are experts at punishing those who were bred, born, circumstanced, and in every way hewn out for criminals, congenital criminals. Thus the sectarian ministers have employment to pray for them, the drug doctors a lucrative trade to dose and drug them to make a business, the lawyers and legislators, seeing the fallacy of their leaders, or fathers in professions, make an excellent living at grab game, by framing laws, and enforcing them or not, as it best suits their pockets and feelings. Good people, awake to a sense of duty, and shuffle off these miserable bloodsuckers in your antichrist and anti-natural church and state. Look through nature up to nature's God, and learn to know that virtue is nothing but voluntary obedience to truth. End of chapter 42 Recording by Meg Turasek Chapter 43 of The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers by Simon Landis Chapter 43 The Bloody Conspirators Mobbed The night at Tabernacle Hall, when the bloody conspirators had a row, on account of Deacon Rob Stew's peculiar sentiments, which caused almost fatal assaults upon the deacon and Reverend Joe Peer, it seemed that they could not finish all their plans. And at that part of their proceedings, when Dr. Tory Pansy announced that he believed the deacon was expiring, another hubbub arose that nearly amounted to a terrific fight amongst the holy saints. But the dignified and influential Sister Nancy Clover nipped the thing in the bud by her cool and determined eloquence. The cause of this hubbub was the various expressions of the saints— upon learning from Dr. Toy Pansy that Deacon Rob Stew was dying. Several downtrodden brothers, who despised the usurping deacon, cried out, Thank the Lord, he is dying! Which immediately aroused the friends of the deacon, who mourned and lamented heartily the dying state of the heroic man of the elect, and who shouted, Silence, apostates! Instantly the latter moved to assault the former, when Sister Nancy Clover cried out vehemently, Shame! Shame! Brothers! Be men, not brutes! If these dissensions are permitted to continue, I feel assured that we shall be our own destroyers, which will prove that we are Dr. Juno's best friends. I have, therefore, one single question to put to you, which I wish you to answer as soon as you understand it. Who do you love best, Dr. Juno or Deacon Rob Stew? And for which of the two will you work as a unit? For you are compelled to choose between the two antagonistic causes which these two heroes advocate. I ask emphatically, for which will you work as a unit until you die? Like lightning, a tremendous unanimous cry rent the air. For Deacon Rob Stew! So I thought, said Nancy Clover, soberly. Therefore, be silent until I go to the deacon's side, 
with Brother Pansy, and learn the state of our beloved brother's health. Whilst Sister Nancy Clover and Dr. Pansy were examining the deacon, the saints were exchanging words on their favorite topic of destroying Dr. Juno's influence. They esteemed it impolitic to make attempts upon his life, because he has too many friends amongst even some of the religious denominations. Besides, too many people believe, since he was sent to the county prison for publishing an obscene book, that we were instrumental in sending him there. Moreover, many believe that we had him incarcerated in the lunatic asylum, and have tried to murder him. Therefore, we must not be too bold in our work, but there are plenty of ways to ruin his reputation. The physician-in-chief has given us a capital plan, and we may get additional new ideas that will do the work. Whilst the saints were thus engaged in the pleasant anticipation of seeing this vile innovator ruined, Sister Nancy Clover returned to the hall and said, Beloved saints, our worthy deacon is dangerously ill, but I have hopes that he will recover and there is one thing for us to take into serious consideration, and decide the matter before we adjourn. That is, what excuse shall we make to the outside world, and the uninitiated saints, for the absence from society of both the deacon and Reverend Joe Peer, because we dare not let them go home, where their friends and saints who do not know of our sacredly secret conclave, will have an opportunity to visit them, as they would ask too many questions about the where and the how they receive such awful blows. It would be impossible to lie out of the matter, and therefore it would assuredly leak out that something most mysterious and incomprehensible was on the tapis, which some of these prying religious brethren and sisters would be determined to ferret out. It is our duty to keep our private matters entirely hid under a bushel, thereby keep the members of the sacredly secret conclave above suspicion. Beloved sister, you are a trump at all times, responded Mr. Grumbler. I do not know if I am a trump or not, brother grumbler, but I can assure you that I can prophesy what will come of us all if we are careless. Our own salvation lies in shrewdness and vigorous business tact. Prayers to God, asking him to do our work, will not answer in such cases. That does well enough to hoodwink zealots and drones, but it cannot answer practical saints like us. "'who have work, responsible work, to perform,' said she. "'I think the best way to manage this matter "'will be to spread a report that the brethren "'were called suddenly away from home. "'A report like this can be started "'without letting anyone know "'that it came from any of us "'who are of the conclave,' responded a brother." Probably that is the best that we can do. At any rate, should we remove them to their homes, and they would not expose the matter when in their right minds, it is still unsafe to trust them as long as they are delirious betimes. Moreover, I am not sure but what Brother Peer will go back on the conclave. He is such a coward, and therefore may never come to the hall again. Or should he see danger breeding on our side, and behold safety on the side of even Dr. Juno, he would fly to him for succor, and expose and have us forthwith arrested. Therefore, beloved saints, you see into what great danger this fight amongst the saints of the conclave has brought us. I do not want you to think that I am cowardly, but duty compels me to be prudent and wise. 
lest our holy cause will be lost for ever. I am, then, in favor of keeping brothers Stu and Pierre closely confined, guarded, and carefully nursed in this place until they are well, and promise to continue their allegiance, and spread a report, as the brother proposed, that they left home on an important mission. Brother Pierre raves frequently in a delirious state, and threatens exposure and vengeance to those who have assaulted him. I move then that we adjourn to meet tomorrow evening, and in the meantime one of the faithful sisters, Dr. Toy Pansy, and myself, will provide comfortable beds and nursing for the sick, said Sister Nancy Clover. The conclave adjourned, all feeling gloomy over the work of the night. They had their eyes opened wide to the danger of quarrels amongst themselves. Nancy Clover had no fears of either of the sick brothers that they would desert the cause, or expose anything in their delirium. Really, Brother Peer was never yet delirious, but she wanted to completely subdue the spirit of rebellion and quarreling, and now was the opportunity to work effectually. She was a long-headed woman, who would not stop at anything to gain her end. The sacredly secret conclave met regularly every evening for a week, which aroused the suspicion of Pat O'Connor, who was sure that some new deviltry was a breedin', and Pat connived with some of his friends to oust them from their hiding places. There was great anxiety in the religious world, asking where Deacon Rob Stew and Reverend Joe Peer were and whilst the saints of the conclave spread their report, as already known by the reader, Pat O'Connor and his friends started an opposite report, which was, however, not made too public, but was only talked about among those who were suspicious of the sanctimonious, who assisted in convicting and imprisoning Dr. Juno, and who could not see any crime in the latter. Therefore, on the evening previous to a great religious celebration, the conclave were in session, having much business before them, when the sentinel stepped into the hall and said, A stranger is insisting to be admitted. What can I do to pacify him, for he will not go away from the outside door? The president pro tem said, Take two or three brethren with you, and go out to him, and ask him to leave, and if he will not leave, go for a policeman and have him arrested. As they opened the outside door, a crowd of policemen and citizens rushed in and overpowered the sentinel and his companions. End of chapter 43 Recording by Mag Turasek. Chapter 44 of The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 44. Dr. Juno informed where Lucinda is imprisoned. The time Pat O'Connor ordered Dr. Juno into a closet at General Armington's residence, when someone knocked at the door at a very unusual hour of the evening, it proved that the bloody conspirators had kept a sharp eye on Dr. Juno after the mistake they made in the insane asylum, when the latter, by permission, visited the insane General Armington. The circumstances are familiar to the reader, and when the person who knocked for admission was admitted, Pat O'Connor recklessly asked him, "'Your Honor, and what can I do to serve you?' 
the visitor being no one long or short of mr grumbler of the conclave stammered and hesitatingly said i i called here for dr juno a friend of mine is sick and i was told that he was seen coming to this house i am to bring him quick as possible to the sick man your friend be sick bees he and you were told that dr juno was see to come in here but dad that creatur what seed him a comin here must have seed his ghost for i tell you dr juno and myself bees mortal enemies do you mind that you better go to his office and not be a huntin around here for that dirty devil angrily said pat o'connor so so responded mr grumbler you then are no friend of this man begorra how can you ax me such a thing again when i told you i hate the seducer of dacent damsels if this dr juno should come to this house now while well, i have the honor to be boss i'd murder him do you mind that yes and i wish you would tell him so and if you was nothing more i thank you to hunt this fine doctor where you may find the devil sarcastically said pat this cool language and defiant air of an ignorant irish man threw brother grumbler entirely off his guard and convinced him that pat was an enemy to dr juno who gave him grumbler the cold shoulder because pat believed him to be the doctor's friend and if juno's patrons would receive such severe treatment from pat o'connor what would dr juno himself get should he call on pat thus mr grumbler departed in a serene and satisfied state of mind reporting his convictions to the saints in whose service he was operating and they also felt easy on that topic still they knew that jemmy and pat o'connor were chums and therefore pat had better be watched when mr grumbler had gone pat and judy closed the house thoroughly and set their prisoner free who was locked up in the closet when pat asked him good doctor and did you hear me blarneying that bloody curmudgeon yes pat you are a tramp surely your ready answers and deliberately cool deportment if the tone of your voice proves anything were excellent and you threw that guilty scoundrel entirely off his guard now then pat i am ready and very anxious to learn more about my dear lucinda about jemmy and the man that was to be drowned said the doctor all right i'll tell you and i'll begin at the beginning jemmy b's judy darlin's cousin and he told us that he seed our sweet mistress lucinda here pat and judy snivelled like innocent children that he he seed her looked up in a third story cell and this bees all meself and judy knows of it jemmy then i suppose was caught at his work of aiding us he spoke to me on several occasions but he said nothing of dear lucinda oh god comfort and save her until i am ready to free her ejaculated dr juno ach good doctor jemmy did not wish to hurt your feelings and that bees why he did not tell you said judy mccrae modestly but still snivelling undoubtedly you are right responded dr juno i knows judy darlin bees right because jemmy told us both that he did not wish you to be made feel so bad said pat and wiping his eyes added oh jemmy bees a good man if he bees a strong roman catholic god bless jemmy and also bless you both 
but I want to disabuse your minds about my ideas of the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic is the only true Church, when in its pristine state. I am a Catholic in every sense of the word, responded Dr. Juno, whose eyes were filling with huge drops of tears whilst he was uttering these words. He was thinking of his beloved Lucinda, and as he was now satisfied that she was in that third story, closely confined in a cell, he could not think of anything else but to free her at once. Faint heart never won fair lady, and a cowardly knave was not worthy of so excellent a creature. Still, a voice cried, Prudence, Prudence. These three distressed souls sat, like innocent children, for some minutes, weeping and meditating on the same subject. They were evidently in this one place with one accord, which caused them to be inspired with the Holy Spirit, when all at once Dr. Juno exclaimed, Good, most faithful friends, God and right here on our side. And who can be against us when he is for us? We shall trust confidingly in his holy laws, but shall rigidly work with all our might to free every one of our friends as speedily as possible. Ah, Dr. Juno, may the Lord bless you for that word, sighed Pat, for poor Jemmy must be a sufferin' much, and so do our sweet lady and master, and myself and Judy Darlin would give our lives to see them every one free. Pat, your great heart is full of the milk of genuine Christian kindness, and God will guide us, provided we shall cautiously use our inwrought faculties, which we shall assuredly do, said the doctor. Ten thousand ideas flashed through Dr. Juno's brain at that moment, and he at once tried to arrange things, which he knew to be true so that instant relief might come to his precious Lucinda. Thought he, what insults may that angel not have suffered, and all on my account. O oh Lord, fill her soul with hope and joy, for the hour of her deliverance is not far distant. Let me see. Jemmy is in the penitentiary. I must at once seek our noble-minded governor of this commonwealth, and ask him to pardon Jemmy, who will be of great service to me. I will do this discreetly, if I can. Then I must organize a secret society for the purpose of matching these bloody conspirators. And as soon as I can get sufficient men together to free my beloved Lucinda, I will make a dash into that hell-hole of an insane asylum. But would it not be better to sue out a habeas corpus and compel the physician-in-chief to produce her in court? No, no, there is no judge now upon the bench who dares to insist to search for her in this hell-hole, if the bloody clique say that no such person is there. Truly, they have made the impression that I seduced, carried away, and deserted the beloved of my soul. Oh, they would make a laughing stock of me for the presumption of asking for a writ of habeas corpus. End of chapter 44 Recording by Meg Turasek Chapter 45 of The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers by Simon Landis. Chapter 45. 
Dr. Juno organizes the secret order of naturalists. Pat, please tell me now about the man of whom you spoke of being drowned, or something to that effect. Maybe he will be of some use to us in freeing our friends and overcoming these bloody conspirators, said Dr. Juno. Certainly. He'll be of use, for he bees very rich and influential, responded Pat. The very man we want to use, if he is alive and ready to expose these dastardly scoundrels. Do you think he will aid us? asked Dr. Juno. Certainly will he, and he bees wide alive, for I drawed him out of the sea a kickin' like a big fish, said Pat. Go on and tell me how this happened, demanded Dr. Juno. Pat O'Connor told him the whole story about Harry Gossamer, with which the reader is already familiar, and said, Mr. Gossamer has gone west. Get away from these bloody curmudgeon. Howsomever, he will be a lookin out for they dirty devils. These hypocrites think he bees drowned dead, and he bees a goin to let em think so until he get a chance to expose em, said Pat. Do you think he would write to me if I would first write to him and ask him to cooperate with me? asked Dr. Juno. Yes, sir, but he bees not a goin by his own name, and if you wish to write tell him, I will say a word, so he know all bees right. His name now bees John Williams Jordan, said Pat. Pat, will you assist me in organizing a secret society, where we can lay plots to entrap these demons? I know now of several true and fearless men who will aid me to the death, responded Dr. Juno. Yes, sir, I'll help all that, and if I die with you all, earnestly said Pat. Dr. Juno cautiously left the house of the general by the side door and reached his office without molestation. He retired, but his brain was so active that he could not sleep for thinking of his darling Lucinda. He planned how he should organize the Order of Naturalists, and as soon as they had enough men indoctrinated into the order, they would free his dear Lucinda. At his next physiological lecture to men alone he proposed to organize a beneficial society at the close of the discourse, but only those who comprehended, appreciated, and were willing to carry out the teachings of nature could become members, and such he invited to remain in their seats after the audience was dismissed. Forty remained, and after stating to these what was to be the motive and work of the proposed secret order of naturalists, ten of them left, and thirty remained to be initiated into the order. The inner workings of this secret body of apt, able, and heroic sons of toil were completely and conscientiously practicable, which always strengthens men's determination. Hence fear or favor for mere gain did not belong to their articles of faith. But they steered straight ahead as one man who, knowing God's holy truth, dared maintain it in spite of any and every power that human invention could bring to bear against it. The membership increased rapidly, and after all their plans and operations were matured, Dr. Juno proposed to have Jemmy pardoned and Miss Lucinda Armington delivered from her unjust incarceration. He said, I have been to the Eastern Penitentiary to see Jemmy, the former overseer of the help at the West Philadelphia Insane Asylum, 
and he avows that Miss Lucinda Armington is confined in the third story of this lunatic asylum. He further says that he was convinced on suspicion that he was instrumental in exposing this foul outrage upon her, as well as my incarceration therein, but that it was simply suspicion, not one particle of proof was produced against him. But Deacon Rob Stew made up his mind that he, Jemmy, was a dangerous person, hence had him arrested, indicted, and convicted, and, although Jemmy was guilty in aiding my escape, as also in the exposure of Miss Armington's imprisonment, still they could not prove it on him. Therefore, if at any time these same bloody conspirators, or their leader, Rob Stew, should become suspicious of any other man, they would dispatch him, as they did myself, Miss Armington, Jemmy, or Mr. Harry Gossamer. With the sad story of the latter, and his miraculous rescue from drowning by the cunning and noble Pat O'Connor, you must all be familiar. Hence we should make a move in the right direction by freeing the beloved daughter of General Washington Armington, who has been driven to real insanity by the villainous abduction and concealment of Miss Armington. I have thought this matter carefully over, and I have come to the conclusion that we can go boldly to this hell-hole asylum where Miss Armington is confined, some evening about nine o'clock, and by all being armed to the teeth, more for show than deathly work, and one man asking permission at the outside gate, and upon the keeper opening it, we all rush in, gagging and binding him, and everyone else as we go along, leaving several to guard them and the gate, whilst the rest march straight for the third story to release Miss Armington, knocking down, gagging, and binding, or imprisoning all who have a voice in the asylum, or who interfere with our work. And after having freed Miss Armington, hinting boldly to the physician-in-chief and managers who may be about that we charge them to be very cautious how they move against us by way of exposing this work of liberating an abducted citizen. I am convinced that such a course will be successful, because they dare not arrest me, nor any of you for having made the assault upon the accursed institution for fear of an exposure and speedy downfall of the bloody clique. Surely, Dr. Juno is a deep-sighted brother, whose course of action in this direction is beyond a doubt the best, and will be attended with the pleasing results of releasing the distressed young Lady Armington, as well as give these bloody hounds a taste of a mysterious and deeply strategic movement by a rival organization, which would almost scare the life out of the whole bloody clique, because they know they are guilty of numerous foul deeds, and therefore the members, like cutthroats and thieves, would fear each bush to be an officer, or an avenger of the wrong these innocent parties have suffered at their hands, said a member of the order. "'Yes, sir, brother,' replied Dr. Juno. "'You are perfectly right, "'and I propose that we meet here next Thursday evening, "'sharp at eight o'clock, "'each member bringing a revolver, "'dirk, blackjack, and any other weapon of death "'that he may possess. "'For I mean work, fight, death, or freedom. "'I have been long enough stigmatized "'and branded by these bloody conspirators,' and their followers as being cruel, low, vile, and criminal. Therefore, the hour has arrived when it behooves me to accept the game of the name they gave me, and I shall be indefatigable, fight, and, if necessary, 
show the black flag, by striking the vipers dead without mercy or quarters. Think for one moment what I have endured whilst thrown into that loathsome felon's cell in the county prison, for publishing a useful and truthful scientific physiological book. Think of the many wily plans that were laid for my ruination and destruction by these human fiends, and then ask me to be any longer merciful, as well ask God for the devil to yield their fixed intentions, and ask me to change the even tenor of my course. I therefore ask you to join me on the evening of next Thursday, when I will general you for the first time through these devil's ground. End of chapter 45 Recording by Meg Teresek. Chapter 46 of The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Teresek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 46. Lucinda Shoots Deacon Stew in Her Cell, and Escapes. Miss Lucinda Armington had received numerous visits from Deacon Rob Stew during her confinement, beside those which we have already described. Two or three of these visits might be worth mentioning, which come near excelling the first and second ones that he made the helpless lady. On one rainy afternoon, the deacon suddenly entered Miss Armington's cell, through one of the secret doors, which startled the poor girl terribly. "'How is my darling young lady?' said he. "'I have been wanting to visit you last week, but business of great importance kept me so busily employed that I could not possibly find time. The last visit I made you was not as pleasant as either of us might have desired it. "'but I hope you will by this time know me and my intentions fully. "'Therefore, yield to my wishes like a wise, obedient child.' "'Indeed, sir,' said she, "'what are your intentions?' "'My intentions, my darling girl, "'are to make you my wife,' said the deacon." "'Well, and how do you propose to do this little business by fair or foul means?' "'Very sarcastically responded Miss Armington. "'Haughty lady, I tell you, by fair means, if you prefer it, "'and by foul, if the former don't suit you,' defiantly ejaculated he. "'Ha, ha, ha!' "'You must think that I am a fool or a baby,' she said. "'Do you forget the tutorage I gave you when you visited me on a previous occasion?' And, rising to her feet, continued, "'Deacon Stew, you had better be careful, "'or I'll murder you before you can leave this cell.' "'Not so fast, my sweet young lady,' "'Do you see this?' "'Drawing a six-shooter from his pocket "'and inging it to her breast. "'Now stand back, or I will you,' "'interrupted the deacon. "'Shoot, you cowardly villain!' she exclaimed, "'and as quick as lightning knocked the pistol from his hand "'and, grasping it in her own, "'pointed it toward his holy breast.' when he winced like a cur and begged her, "'Oh, do not shoot! The pistol is loaded!' and tried to back out of a secret door, when she said commandingly, "'Stand still, and do not move one step, 
or I'll blow out your cowardly and villainous brains. Do you hear me? Remember, I am as good as my word. He stood like a statue, almost petrified with fear and horror, when she began to laugh at him and said, You are a fine fellow, a nice saint, a model deacon, who dares to insult a helpless woman by all sorts of proposals and assaults. Now, I want you to listen to me sharply, and swear by the God that is above us that you will do as I wish you to do, or I will shoot you as dead as a mouse. Do you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I do, humbly responded the bold deacon. In the first place, I want you to swear that you will never more harm Victor Juno, by word or deed, and will make immediate reparation for all the injury you have done him in the past. Swear it, she commanded. I cannot do that, anything but that, he responded. She cocked the pistol, and fired one shot into his right arm, the bullet penetrating the center of the forearm and lodging in the plastered wall of the cell, when she said, This is shot number one, to disable your right arm. The next will be your black heart, furiously said Miss Armington. O oh Lord, help me, help me, ejaculated the pious deacon. No, sir, the Lord won't help you, but I will. And raising her pistol towards his heart, continued, Will you swear, or die in your sin and shame? I'll swear to anything, ejaculated he. Propose the oath. I will. Repeat after me without mental reservation or prevarication, she said, and continued. I, Rob Stew, do solemnly swear, without mental reservation, that I will never injure by word or deed Victor Juno, and that I will make immediate reparation for all the injury I have done to Victor Juno in the past, so help me God. Now, Miss Armington, I have done it. Will you, therefore, put that pistol down and let me go in peace? said his deaconship. No, sir, not by a long ways. But you shall now give me your keys to this prison cell, and I will lock you up, and leave this place in your stead. Holy Lord God, meditated the deacon, and, turning deathly pale, stammered, Miss uh, Armington, would you be so cruel as to demand all this of me? Yes, sir, and more, for fear that demons and lunatics in the place below should recapture me. I'll demand you to take off your coat, vest, pants, and hat, and give them to me, for a disguise, that I may represent your holy self for once in my life. This may seem immodest, but a desperate woman knows no frivolous modesty that she would not sacrifice for an honorable deliverance from a fiend like yourself. Do you hear? Take off your clothes, resolutely responded she. You certainly would not compel me to strip off my garments before you. Off, interrupted Miss Armington, or die, coward and cocking her pistol, which made him speedily tear open, take off and deliver the same to her. But she did not attempt to put them on herself until she requested the deacon to tear a sheet into pieces, wherewith she made him firmly tie his own feet together, then ordered him to make a loop of another strip of sheet and place his hands between his back into the loop which she drew tight with her left hand, whilst she held the pistol in her right hand for a shot, should he fail to obey. As soon as his hands were secured by her left hand, 
she laid down the pistol and bound them securely. Then she threw him on the floor and cast a lot of bedding on him. To this he objected and was inclined to scream when she commanded him to open his mouth, and she stuffed a large rag into it and bound a strip of the torn sheet over it and his eyes. Thus, his deaconship secured, she removed her heavy skirts, then donned the saintly deacon's pants, vest, coat, and hat. But all were too large, which made her look dilapidated. However, after getting the keys of her cell, and pistol in hand, the desperate young heroine started on her way toward freedom. After leaving her cell and alighting upon the corridor of the second floor of the asylum, she met several keepers, who approached her, staring with amazement at her, without saying a word, when she asked them, "'Which is the best way to leave the asylum?' To which a surly fellow said, "'I don't think that a crazy lunatic like you will leave it any way.' "'Why not, sir?' she said. "'I am no lunatic. I want you to know.' "'I am not so sure of that,' responded the surly fellow, and added, "'John, go for the superintendent, and tell him a strange creature is in our ward, and ask him what we shall do with the queer thing.' Miss Armington trembled at this state of affairs, but she made up her mind to fight her way out, if she had to shoot a dozen. The physician-in-chief and the superintendent both arrived at the spot where she had the conversation with the keepers, and seeing that they might surround her, she backed into a corner of the corridor near a door. And when the physician-in-chief ordered the men to secure her, she drew her revolver and cocked it, and said defiantly, I'll shoot the first man that lays a finger on me. Open the door and let me depart in peace. Who are you? demanded the physician in chief. I am a sane person who wishes to be let out of this place, she said. Seize the ruffian, commanded the physician in chief, when the surly fellow made for her, but she shot him through his right arm, which scared the whole batch of them, and the trouble was how to get the stranger out of that corner. "'I have it,' said the superintendent, silently, to the physician-in-chief. "'I will go and cause that door by him to be opened, and make him believe that he may escape that way, when either you or I will grasp him from behind.' "'All right,' replied the physician-in-chief. The door was opened, and Miss Armington saw what they were after, but she thought that very likely she could make her escape. Therefore, she would go through the open door, but as she moved the keepers were upon her back, when she turned upon them and fired at the breast of the leader but at that moment someone grasped her elbows behind her from the outside of the open door. End of chapter 46 Recording by Meg Turasek. Chapter 47 of The Social War of 1900 or The Conspirators and Lovers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Turasek. The Social War of 1900, or The Conspirators and Lovers, by Simon Landis. Chapter 47. Lucinda is re-arrested before she escapes. The superintendent's plan of opening the door proved a success, and as Miss Armington turned to fire, he grasped both her elbows from behind, which raised the pistol the moment it went off, and thereby missed hitting anyone. 
the superintendent at once took the revolver from her hand and rather roughly handled the poor girl when she said you have gained the victory and i will therefore yield honorably like a whipped enemy be so kind as to let me rise by this time the physician-in-chief and the rest of the keepers help and innocent lunatics gathered around her the physician-in-chief at once recognized her face when he ordered her to be removed to his private office and directed the rest except the superintendent and two managers to attend to their business after these four men and miss armington were locked into his private office the physician-in-chief said well young lady how do you come by this male garb and pistol i know you miss armington miss armington exclaimed one of the managers yes miss armington in disguise said the doctor and added what do i see deacon rob stew's coat hat and vest or i mistake myself well yes i acknowledge they are his garments which may give you some idea how i came by this graceful disguise said miss armington with contempt what the deacon did not aid you to escape by disguising yourself in his clothes ejaculated the physician-in-chief looking amazed as well as his comrades no sir not exactly aid your excellency tauntingly replied she how then did you get his clothes and that pistol who gave you the pistol said the physician-in-chief i do not know that i choose to be so closely catechized unless you promise to give me my freedom which i think i deserve after having gone to all this trouble she said you ask too much how so interrupted miss armington what have i ever done to deserve this confinement and to be compelled to be continually insulted by that rascally old deacon stew what you call him rascally when he has favored you with this disguise he has not favored me interposed she girl you confound me said the physician-in-chief did you not say that these were the deacon's garments and that he gave them to you yes they were his garments and he gave them to me but now they are mine for i have earned them by hard labor and at the risk of womanly modesty said she explain yourself said he for instead of understanding you i become more bewildered by your remarks do you tantalizingly responded miss armington yes miss you are a puzzle to me said the physician-in-chief doctor i am astonished at you exclaimed the superintendent don't you see with half an eye that the creature is as crazy as a loon can be come let us lock her up and attend to better business than trifling with her indeed bah you are a pretty fellow to be so wise as to pronounce me a lunatic if i am crazy i'll wager my life against a dozen soft heads like yours that i can outrival you in anything haughtily replied miss armington and continued you must not think because you are clad with a little authority that your august position raises you to manhood a thing you do not possess come come this is more idle talking than if miss armington were insane and we would amuse ourselves over her wanderings and therefore i ask the superintendent to go and attend to better business responded the physician-in-chief and so saying he unlocked the office when the superintendent left but the other continued 
Come now, Miss Armington, please tell me where you got that pistol. I got it also from Deacon Rob Stew, interrupted Miss Armington. When did you get it from him? said he. Not an hour since, said she. Really, Miss Armington, you must be crazy, said the physician-in-chief. Ah, indeed, you, too, doubt my sanity. Do you want me to prove my soundness of mind and purpose to you in the presence of these strangers? said she. Well, you astound me. But you have the deacon's clothes, and I do not see how you got the pistol, unless he gave it to you. Yet I cannot understand whether he has proved false to you or us, said he. You did not answer my question. I said, did you want me to prove my soundness of mind and purpose to you in the presence of these strangers? But perhaps they are familiar with the doings of this place, said Miss Armington. No, Miss, it is useless for you to make that attempt, for we all know why you are in this institution, and as I cannot understand you, and you will not explain, I shall be compelled to return you to your old quarters, responded the physician-in-chief. I can assure you that I expected nothing better from you, and as these gentlemen are co-conspirators of yours and the holy deacons, I cannot call upon them for succor or sympathy, haughtily said she. Madam, responded one of the managers, you have my heartfelt sympathy. Then assist me to escape, or use your influence to have me released she pled. He dropped his head, and, with tears in his eyes, said, As cheerfully as I would do so of my own accord, yet am I powerless to aid you, unless you consent to become the deacon's wife. Ah, indeed, you too desire that. Well, gentlemen, if such I may call you, I am ready to be conducted to my cell, where I will show you a fine specimen of a deacon, sneeringly said she. What, you did not murder him? asked the physician-in-chief, terror-stricken. Oh, no, he is too mean, low, and cowardly a thing to kill. He and his likes, looking at them with a contemptuous frown, better live a while yet that they may see the glory of the noble hero through whose instrumentality i am incarcerated and insulted but mark me i feel it in my inmost soul that the tables will shortly turn and then i may laugh at you when you get your deserved reward said she they conducted the disguised heroine back to her cell, but, lo, the horrible-looking deacon, with bloodshot eyes, swollen head, and almost suffocated, lying in one corner of the cell, dumbfounded the gentleman, who at once relieved him of his effectual gag and shackles, and the physician-in-chief asked, "'How came this so?' But there was no reply, because the deacon fainted, whilst Miss Armington smiled, and really seemed to enjoy the joke. This enraged the physician-in-chief, and for the first time he threatened violence to Miss Armington, who coolly said, "'He only got his dues.' "'He is dying!' exclaimed the physician-in-chief. "'And you are his murderer, young woman!' Yes, in self-defense I subdued him, as any one would, and as I would do again, heedlessly said Miss Armington. Suddenly the saintly and hypocritical opossum-acting deacon came to, and seeing the pistol in the hand of the physician-in-chief, he grasped it, 
and rising to his knees, raised it, and fired at Miss Armington, ejaculating furiously, You she-devil, die! End of chapter 47 Recording by Meg Turasek